Hi, welcome to another episode of the Sankofa Pan-African series with me, Omiyo Yinso. In this episode and the next, I'll be focusing on the Africville Museum, which is located in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. It is a museum which I believe is very important to the history of Africans, not just in North America, but also on the continent of Africa. I know we've not yet touched on the Arab or Atlantic slave trades in this series, but we will. Like I explained in ep earlier episodes, although we will be discussing a lot of history, this series is not primarily a vehicle for teaching history. As such, the topics that we treat do not follow a linear pattern. So I continue to depend on your comments, questions, and contributions to help develop and structure future episodes. I'll also bring other people on to help throw light on various topics of interest so that the series serves as an avenue to help highlight Pan-African issues, celebrate Pan-Africanism, achievements, and critiques where necessary. To help us understand what I believe is a uniquely indomitable spirit of Africans in the diaspora, the spirit of a little-known place called Africville is an old friend and very dear colleague, Juanita Peters. Juanita is the executive director of the Africville Museum. She's an actress, journalist, news anchor, playwright, film and theater director. She's m most known as a reporter and anchor on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC News at Six in New Brunswick in the 80s and 90s. She's also a host of four seasons of CBC's Dark Side, a documentary series. Some of her films include I Made a Vow, Hannah's Story, Africville Can't Stop Now. She also directed two seasons of the film Nova Scotia award-winning dramatic series, Studio Black. As a playwright, she's given us The Sand Family, the Mother Club, I'm Possible, The Green Book. She currently lectures in playwriting in the theater at Dalhousie University. Juanita Peters is a founding member of Women in Film and Television Atlantic. So good to have you with us on this series, Juanita. Where is Africville? Well, if you've never been to Canada, Africville is on the far east coast of Canada in the province of Nova Scotia in the capital called Halifax. And it sits on the southern shore of the Bedford Basin. How did it start? Well, one of the things that people may not realize is that blacks have been in the province of Nova Scotia for a very long time. In fact, the first recorded black in Nova Scotia was in 1604 during the founding of Port Royal. Now, blacks that it became um, members of the community of Africville came through several different migrations. Uh, first of all, when uh, in 1604, you know, that uh, a number of slaves were brought to, to Nova Scotia uh, in the building of communities. They were brought here by the British and the French. Uh, and then, of course, the American Revolution, uh, the numbers of people who uh, agreed to fight uh, during the American Revolution and were promised freedom, uh, where Jamaican Maroons came. And I always say they were the smartest because they only came for 40 years and they saw that things weren't working out and they decided to go back. So um, we've had a number of migrations uh, over the years and a number of those people settled into Africville and various other communities throughout the province of Nova Scotia. I didn't even know there were blacks in um, in Nova Scotia before the loyalists came, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah, great. Oh, so, okay, well, I knew about the Maroons, but somehow I've never been able to place them in, te in terms of time. So this gives us a good idea. I do meet people uh, from Jamaica. They often know more 
about the black history of the Jamaicans here in Nova Scotia than Nova Scotians do because they learn about the contributions that they made uh, to, to Halifax. You know, what you just said now um, drives, you know, something home to me um, because my mother's family actually migrated from Sierra Leone back to Lagos. And I did not even know about the relationship between Nova Scotia and Sierra Leone until I came to live yeah. in Halifax. Yeah. And I'm glad that you're asking that question because yeah. we actually had a group uh, from Sierra Leone come and visit us. Uh, this summer. And one of the things that we did was we traveled together uh, to Shelburne, which is where uh, the majority of the Blacks landed in Nova Scotia. And we planted a tree together in um, commemoration of our shared heritage. And here's how the heritage begins. So Thomas Peters um, was a fugitive slave from Wilmington, North Carolina. And in 1776, he uh, joined uh, a black um, regiment called the Black Pioneers. And they were transported uh, from New York to Nova Scotia. And Thomas Peters became, he, he went up the ranks and he became a sergeant. And he also became the spokesperson for the blacks who, who came here during those migrations. So a few thousand people. He landed in Digby County, Nova Scotia, and he was uh, not happy with the provisions that were given uh, the blacks. And so he moved to St. John, New Brunswick, but he found that he was having the same uh, issues in St. John, New Brunswick. They were not given uh, the things that they were promised. So he became a spokesperson for the Blacks and he wrote many petitions to the king uh, in hopes of, of uh, getting answers to why they weren't getting what they were promised. And he actually also traveled to England in hopes of getting an audience with the king. But that didn't happen. But what did happen was he met a man by the name of Granville Sharp, who was starting something called um, the uh, da, 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 Sierra Leone Company. It was called the Sierra Leone Company. And, um, and so Thomas Peters came back to the Blacks in Nova Scotia, him and John Clarkson, and they uh, presented this to the Blacks. We have three choices. We can stay here in hopes that the promises are eventually honored and things get better. We can move to another part of this land, meaning further west, or we can board these ships and go and settle into this new colony, which eventually became Freetown. Unfortunately, Thomas Peters died within a year of landing in Sierra Leone or Freetown. Uh, but not without leaving a legacy here in Canada. I am the third great, great, great granddaughter of, of Thomas Peters. And up until uh, 20 years ago, we still uh, had that one acre of land uh, that was given to Tom Pe Thomas Peters in our family in Annapolis Royal. Wow. Wow. So this is actually living history. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. And I also know that there are Peterses, there are, you know, in um there are families that, that, that have the last name Peters in um Freetown and then in, in, in Nigeria, you know, who knows what the links and the, the connections are. I, I I I certainly believe, you know, that um where um Africans in the diaspora, like um African Nova Scotians, are a lot closer than Africans who are back on the continent than we actually know about. I, I, I know, know this from my experience of living in Halifax and how I saw people who were like dead ringers for members of my family, you know, and things like that. It's a smaller world than, than, than we, we often remember. It's so true because uh, even before telling my story, uh, when the group came from Sierra Leone, they did not realize that I was a Peters. And... Um, the minute they got off the bus, there were just so many uh, almost eerie, you know, similarities between a lot of my great uncles and aunts, uh, just in mannerisms and approach. And it was, you know, quite warming, really, really heartwarming. Yeah, I know. I ran into people who could have been my first cousins when I was living in, uh, in Nova Scotia. <laughs> 
Yes, very yes. true. So, so uh, back to Africville. So it was destroyed, wasn't yes. it? Um, can you tell yeah. us how that came about? Yes, you know, um, one of the things that I think is hard for people to understand is that you have a community like any other community where people move to that location and start building uh, something, uh, something that's important to them. Um, but during this time, one of the things that the city did was they created and incorporated and distributed everything that was undesirable to everyone else in that community. So the community became surrounded with things like the infectious disease hospital, um, the abattoir, the open dump. And remember, the open dump is also um, what receives all that infectious waste from the uh, disease, the infectious disease hospital. Um, if, if it was something you wouldn't want in your community, it existed uh, in surrounding Africville. So what happens? What happens is that your land becomes devalued. Um, there was no running water. People uh, paid taxes, just like the rest of Africville, but they did not receive the same um, services that everyone else receives. So they did not have running water. They did not have paved roads. Uh, what is one of the things that happens when you don't have running water? Um, it really limits uh, how things like banks you know, um, view your your dwelling, you know, can you get insurance on it if you can't get running water to it? Um, and so often, you know, houses would burn down if there was a fire because they couldn't get enough water to to the, the dwelling. Um, one of our board members very vividly tells the story of her being a little girl in a house uh, in Africville catching on fire and seven children uh, perishing in that fire and her and her family being there and witnessing it and the, the trauma that that caused that nobody could help this family. And so when we talk about things like resources not being made available, that is the real impact of that. It's not just about money and sense. It's about lives. It's about long-term lives. Uh, many Africville residents have claimed that because they live so close to the open dump and all the things that it delivered into the community, that they there is a high rate of cancer uh, from descendants. Um, and there are other counties, black communities, who, who talk about that as well. Like Let me get this straight. So they were paying taxes the same way yes. as other Nova Scotians were paying taxes and they never had any benefits from their taxes. And this kind of led to a deterioration in the quality of life in the community. And um, it wasn't just happening in Africville alone. It was happening in other um, Aboriginal Nova Scotian communities as well as other Black um, African Nova Scotian communities. Yes. Yeah. So still today, you know, uh, a number of Black and uh, uh, Native communities will, are still having that conversation uh, because whenever there is something... Uh, um, not favorable to be placed somewhere. Those are the first communities that government look to place them. It's like out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and I really need uh, people to just sort of understand not only what that does to a community, but what that does to individuals when you are considered uh, less than. How do you move through the world when you grow up considering um, people looking at you like you are less than, and then how do you feel about yourself? Um, and so the only ways that you can really uh, understand that is to understand the texture and the temperature of the time. Please join us next time as we continue to celebrate the spirit of Africville. I believe that like me, some of you out there are comparing the kind of discrimination that the people of Africville suffered with a lot of the problems that Africans are facing on the continent of Africa today at the hands of fellow Africans who are supposed to be our political leaders. As a Lagosian, Morocco comes readily to my mind. As a woman, I'm also aware of 
women who are facing all kinds of discrimination simply because they were born female. And it is tempting to shrug and ask, so what else is new? Or to paraphrase a less palatable saying, life is hard and then you die. But I believe there are lessons to be learned from every major historical occurrence. What can we, continental Africans, learn from people of African descent in the diaspora who, who have and continue to endure racism and other forms of discrimination? What are the short and long lasting effects of inequality, inequity, and being perceived or treated as less than human? Please. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like and share this video. See you next time.